Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is time to begin cases with the EAES Joint Symposium. And I'd like to welcome you and thanks to all of you joining this symposium. My name is Kyung Yeol Ho from Sun Chan Hyang University Hospital in Seoul, Korea. And it is great pleasure to chair this wonderful special symposium. This symposium is scheduled with uh, two moderators, me and uh, the doctor, uh, Professor Andrea, who is the president of EAES and the professor of surgery, University of Pavia, but he is not available at the moment. Uh, I may perhaps busy. So I, I have to moderate uh, this symposium alone. Okay. This symposium is uh, consisted with uh, four topics in the schedule and the symposium and the subject of the topics are important issue, something related to bariatric and metabolic surgery, but uh, excluded the surgical procedure. Okay, let's move to the uh, first topic. Uh, this here is a pre presentation about the speaker. The presenter is Yoon Seok Ho and uh, he is from Inha University School of Medicine. Uh, in China, Korea. He is one of the founding member of Korean Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery and ex-president also. He contributed very much for expansion and the prosperity of Korean Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery and so on forth. Title of our topic is uh, the first prospective cohort study for medical and the surgical treatment on obesity in Korea, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for having me to KS ERS annual meeting. I am very sorry that we have to have a virtual online meeting. My talk is about the first multicenter prospective study on bariatric surgery in Korea, perhaps in Asia. I have no idea if there are some ancient studies in progress at the moment, but in Korea, the COVID-2 trial has started. The Korean obesity treatment study, in short, is COVID trial. Title of this study is The Efficacy and Safety of Bariatric Surgery for morbidly obese patient in Korea. Twelve institutes have participated as the surgical group and eleven institutes as a medical group and three institutes are in charge of control, controlling data quality and statistics. The objective of this trial is to evaluate the rate change and cost effectiveness of bariatric surgery. We have four sub-studies. The first one is for the surgery and the second one is for medical treatment as control group. The third is for long-term research of established codes. And the last one is for clinical data management and cost-effectiveness analysis. This study is granted by Korean Ministry of Health and Welfare and closed 2018. COVID has four sub-studies, as I told you. In the surgery sub-study, we compared runway gastric bypass with a sleeve gastrectomy. As for medical sub-study, we compared local sharing with placebo using a double-blind protocol. And we collected and analyzed the data of a retrospective code established in 2011. In the prospective studies, we collected the data for body weight, changes of comorbidities, cost effectiveness, QOL, 
and the surgical complications. Class 2 obesity in Korea is defined as patients with a BMI 30 to 35. Class 3 obesity patients and class 2 obesity patients with comorbidities were included. Other criteria were like this. This table is the protocol sheet for surgical group. Laboratory data included routine labs, lipid profile, micronutrients, and some hormones. Upper GI endoscopy, polysomnography, fast CT, QL survey were performed, and some samples were collected and stored in all patients enrolled in such group. Special studies were performed for the patient with each comorbidity. Echocardiography for hypertension, oral glucose tolerance test with a colon level for type 2 diabetes, four questionnaires, EQ5D3 level, EQ5D visual analog scale, IWQL light, OP scale was surveyed and hospital costs were collected. This is the list of collaborating researchers. I want to take this time to say thank you very much for their contribution. Especially, Jeon Gang was the sub PI for the medical treatment group, and Do Jung Ba enrolled the most patients for the surgical group. 311 patients were enrolled. Based on inclusion and exclusion criteria, 47 were excluded and 264 subjects are enrolled finally. 64 patients were allocated to the surgical group and 200 patients were allocated to the medical group. Patients in the surgical group underwent UMI gastric bypass or sleep gastrectomy based on their personal medical condition including the risk of gastric cancer, reflux esophagitis, and so on. 43 patients received sleep gastrectomy and 21 patients UMI gastric bypass. 200 patients in medical group were allocated by double blind protocol and 102 patients discontinued during the follow. This is a weight loss gap. As you can see, body weight of the medical group was almost unchanged in the local selling group or placebo group. In surgical group, they lost body weight over 25% at one year and kept losing body weight. Many studies have reported losing weight is going on till one and a half year to over 30%. The patients in the surgical group lost more weight than medical group and have statistical significance in any time point. But in each group, there was no difference between their muscles. This graph shows the weight loss according to the degree of obesity at baseline. We divided each group into three subgroups, obesity class 2, obesity class 3, and BMI over 40. There is no difference in each group. Although subgroup with BMI 30 to 35 seems to have less weight loss. These are the changes in comorbidities. The data included all patients 
A1C was significantly higher in surgical group at baseline than medical group, but decreased to normal range. Resting gl blood glucose level decreased and after three months lower than the medical group, even though the level was higher at baseline. As for blood, pr blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic pressure decreased significantly in surgical group. The lipid profile improved significantly in surgical group. The remission rates for diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia were significantly higher in surgical group. Remission rate for type 2 diabetes was 47.8% in surgical group. It was slightly lower than that of our other reports. All patients were surveyed on four kinds of QA questionnaires. Korean versions of these questionnaires were already validated. EQ5D is the tool for general health and IWQL and OP scale is for the obesity specific tools. At baseline, QR scores for all instruments were poorer in surgical group, but this, this difference was reversed over time and all instruments had better QR scores after two years regardless of poor baseline QR scores. This table presents the result of cost effectiveness analysis. Generally, the surgical group paid more cost except the patient with BMI 35 to 37.5. ISO is incremental cost effectiveness ratio. It means how much to pay the cost for getting ideal health for a year. If the calculated ISO is less than GDP, the tool proves cost effective. Korean GDP at the time was 32,000 US dollar. Patients who underwent bariatric surgery spent 235 US dollar more and gained 0.348 more of quality adjusted life year or quality or lifetime. Bariatric surgery was a cost effective alternative with an ISO of 674 US dollar quality to medical treatment. This cost is very small comparing Korean GDP. 32,000 US dollar. Three patients of 21 uh, lung and gastric plate pass and one patient of 43 sleep gastrectomy experienced early complications within 30 days, whereas two of lung and gastric pass, gastric plate pass and seven sleep gastrectomy experienced late complications after 30 days. Reflux esophagitis is a major complication of sleep gastrectomy as expected. Now another study of COVID trial was for the result of long-term follow-up. The patients were the member of the court established in 20 11, which study was performed by several collaborators of this study. Mean BMI of surgical group decreased from 39 to 29 and maintained for 5 years. We compared the preference of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia between surgical and medical treatment group. 
The diabetes prevalence of the surgical group dropped from 51% to 33%. As for hypertension, it dropped from 65% to 24% and as for dyslipidemia, from 35% to 8% for 5 years. But in the medical group, the prevalence of these comorbidities increased or sustained. This study was adapted as reference data for the introduction of government health insurance in 2019. This insurance covers metabolic and bariatric surgery for the patient with class 3 obesity and class 2 obesity with comorbidities as well as for uncontrolled type 2 diabetes patients with BMI over 27.5. Before national insurance coverage, metabolic surgery was approved as a new medical technology in Korea. The data of this study was also used as reference data. And samples collected from this study were supplied for several basic researches. These two impacts have been already published or manuscript is completed. I expect an excellent achievement in the field of uh, microbiome and metabolism. COVID trial was the first prospective study in Korea in many aspects. Some studies in Korea have reported the same subject, but all of them were retrospective and were single center study. And the first long-term report for comparing medical and surgical treatment in Korea. Another issue is that this study contributed to the introduction of national insurance coverage. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. And uh, as, as you know, our country is, uh, has a uh, unique characteristics of bariatric surgery compared to uh, the Western country. First of all, lack of understanding about the morbid obesity and uh, bariatric and metabolic surgery. So application of uh, the medical insurance coverage has, has, has been very difficult. Now, the insurance coverage of bariatric surgery is possible with uh, his great effort of the presenter, the Professor Ho. But uh, unfortunately, uh, Professor Ho is not available at the moment, perhaps very busy. So question and the comment should be postponed to next time. Let's move to the second topic. <clears throat> okay, the title of the second topic is Bariatric Surgery and Ventral Hernia, How to Face This Problem. The speaker is Salvador Morales Conda. And uh, I will introduce him uh, briefly. He is Associate Professor of the Department of Surgery and the University of Sevilla, Spain. And he is now President of Spanish Association of Surgeons and the President of, President Elect, next President of the European Association of Endoscopic Surgeons, EAES, the uh, President Elect. And he has uh, several scientific and the social recognition being his work spread widely to several national and international congresses and being named uh, and one of the best surgeons in Spain. And his speech is concerning the feasibility of concomitant surgery of ventral hernia repair while conducting bariatric surgery. Please. Hello. First of all, I would like to uh, congratulate the Korean Society of Endoscopic and Laparoscopic Surgery uh, um, for this uh, anniversary, 25th year of working training and education. Congratulations from my, uh, from me personally and from the EAS. And as a president-elect of the EAS, I would like to offer this link of collaboration for the future and continue working together 
for uh, better uh, training and education of surgeons around the world. So the topic I'm gonna cover is bariatric surgery and ventral hernia, how to face this problem. Those, uh, these are my disclosure. And I would like to start talking about abdominal wall surgery in obese patients. You can see that obesity, it is a problem. It is a problem for ventral hernia since the rate of recurrence is higher in this type of patients. The reasons are two. One is because in normal activity, the intra-abdominal patient or the obese patient is higher than normal patient. But there is another factor, and this factor is a poor wound healing potential of these patients. So if you have a wound that is not going to heal properly, and on the other hand, you're going to have more intradominal pressure, the rate of recurrence, of course, are going to be higher. Now, what about laparoscopy? Does laparoscopy solve this problem? The answer is clear, yes. There is an important paper published uh, 20 years ago in which they were comparing, depending on the BMI, the results of lap the laparoscopic approach of a ventral hernia. And you can see that those patients with BMI less than 30 have the same result that those patients with BMI uh, higher than 40. So that gives you the opportunity to understand that laparoscopy solve a problem of recurrence in obese patients. Why this happened? There is several reasons. One is because the good thing of laparoscopy is the important diagnostic tool and is able to identify a non-detected defect, a clinical examination, and after even a CT scan. So that gives you the opportunity to identify another defect that cannot be identified by an open approach. On the other hand, the good thing of laparoscopy is that you can have a nice overlap without, uh, 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 without increasing the dissection of the, of the subcutaneous tissue. On the other hand, one of the goal of laparoscopic approach is to cover the whole incision and also to include the rectal diastasis in case of a ventral hernia. So the good thing of laparoscopy is that give you the chance to cover the whole incision or to reinforce the direct to diastasis without increasing the uh, uh, dissection of subcutaneous tissue and therefore increasing the uh, possibility of having an infection. And in fact, this is one of the main factors related to, uh, uh, to, the, to avoid um, recurrence after the laparoscopic approach, is that laparoscopic approach in obese patients reduce the morbidity associated to the wound the, uh, of, of, of obesity, of uh, open approach. And that's easy to understand. After a ventral hernia repair, for sure, you are going to have some kind of liquid, some kind of serama uh, between the mesh and the subcutaneous tissue. It's not the same after an open approach in which the whole incision is going to, go, going to be in contact with this liquid than after a laparoscopic approach in which this serama is going to be sterile and the contact of the skin with the uh, succutaneous tissue is gonna be far from this area. So the possibility of having an infection is lower. At the end, all consensus conference give the same advice. Obesity is one of the main indication of laparoscopic approach of ventral hernia. So what about facing this problem of a ventral hernia in this patient uh, with a concomitant uh, bariatric procedure? It is safe. All the literature at the end say the same conclusion. It doesn't matter the result, but it's safe. It's safe to face this problem. But I think that the, uh, the main answer, that the main question that we need to answer is when to perform both procedure at the same time and how to do it. Regarding when, I think the main question is if we should perform both procedure uh, in a concomitant way, or we should defer the repair of the ventral hernia for a second stage. Regarding against concomitant, this concept of concomitant surgery, there is several reasons. One is the fear of contamination of a mesh place intradominally. And at, see, uh, and at this uh, point, you can see an important paper from Raoul Rosenthal that even after a sleep gastrectomy, all the culture of the liquid, of the intraperitoneal liquid uh, uh, in the intradominal cavity after, uh, are negative. After a sleep, after a gastric bypass, there is a 15% of bacteria in this liquid. 
On the other hand, uh, there is, uh, 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 if you perform the repair of these hernias after, um, uh, in a second stage, um, if you repair, if you perform the abdominoplasty in a second stage after a previous concomitant surgery, you are going to find the mesh in the middle of the surgical field. So it will be better to perform the dermal lipectomy together with the ventral hernia at the same time in a second stage. The third reason is one clear reason that it's been in the literature for years. If you decrease weight, you, uh, you are going to decrease the recurrence rate. And that is the other, the third reason against a concomitant surgery. But the main reason to the first surgery is this paper in which when you perform a concomitant surgery, you have more chances to have higher morbidity of the surgery than when you perform the primary uh, bariatric procedure and you uh, delay, uh, defer the, uh, the ventral hernia repair. And in fact, in a large database in which uh, it is included, uh, more than 4,500 cases, you can see that concomitant surgery of the ventral hernia with the primary uh, bariatric procedure have a higher major uh, complication rate than performing the primary bariatric procedure. A major complication include reoperation, deep surgical side infection, and sepsis. So, but on the other side of the coin, what do we find in favor of concomitant surgery? The main uh, advice is you can avoid an emergency surgery because you can, uh, you avoid a process of incarceration or strangulation. One of the first paper in this, uh, uh, in this uh, sense was uh, showing higher percent, uh, an important percentage of paper, 30, uh, of patients, 35%, that ha need to undergo an emergency surgery because incarceration and strangulation. With the proper protocol, you can see, like uh, in the literature uh, later, we have observed a decrease of this possibility of an emergency surgery, 5% in some cases, or even 0% in more recent paper. So at the end, what will be my advice? Concomitant or deferred surgery? I think we need an algorithm, and this algorithm will be based in some factor. Uh, for example, the first reason, the first thing you have to analyze is if you had in front of you a symptomatic hernia or a, an asymptomatic hernia. If you have a symptomatic hernia, the first question that you need to answer, if there is in, an indication for lab approach of a, the ventral hernia. And if there is no indication for the lab approach or of la the laparoscopic approach of the ventral hernia, either you perform both procedures by, by open or you do the laparoscopic bariatric procedure and then you open to, uh, to solve, uh, to repair the, um, the, the ventral hernia. But if there is indication for uh, the laparoscopic approach of the ventral hernia, you perform both procedure procedures by laparoscopy. What about if you have an asymptomatic hernia? My advice is you need to perform a CT scan. If, and if there is a bowel incarceration, then you move in this part of the diagram and you continue performing both, uh, both procedures at the same time. Because when you have the bowel incarcerated and the patient starts decreasing uh, weight, the pulling process of the, of the, of the, of the abdomen will have more chances to have an uh, acute incarceration or a strangulation that they will need a, um, a surgery. But if you have only a mental incarcerated, my advice will be to perform only the bariatric procedure. So if you have this picture inside, just leave it, don't touch it, continue the bariatric procedure and don't release the content. You, you can do the procedure leaving the uh, uh, the omentum inside the sac, and you can perform a sleeve gastrectomy as you see in this video, and um, because it's important to leave the omentum in, uh, in place. Why is the reason? Because if you uh, remove the omentum from the hernia, it could happen 
what happened to this surgeon of my team during one of his first sleep that he thought it was a good idea to remove the uh, fatty tissue from the, the omentum from the sac of a primary ventral hernia. And what he ended up was having an acute strangulation because the defect was uh, was leave, uh, was open and, and the content went inside and have an acute strangulation. So if you are in this part in which the CT scan uh, give you an idea of a bowel incarceration like this, uh, you should leave it uh, behind and you should go and repair the ventral hernia. Otherwise, you will have a problem of acute strangulation. So we know how to do it. We know when to do a concomitant surgery, when to defer the surgery, and then the question will be how. How to perform the ventral hernia and how to perform the bariatric procedure. Let's start about the ventral hernia. Third question, open up laparoscopic, because this fear that we could have of leaving a mesh intra-abdominally after a bariatric procedure based on this paper from Raoul Rosenthal that I showed you before. So uh, based on this paper, you can see that uh, if you perform both pr procedures at the same time and you perform the open, uh, uh, an open approach of the ventral hernia, you have more chance of having recurrence and more chance of having wound-related complications. So the answer is clear. You should go for a laparoscopic approach. When you perform laparoscopy, should we avoid mesh and use just direct closure and defer the, uh, do a direct closure or you should use an intradominal mesh. This was a patient that I performed a sleeve gastrectomy. You see that what I did at that time was just to close the defect because I wasn't sure. Uh, I didn't want to leave a mesh intradominal and this is what I did. I placed a uh, sun suture, I closed the defect, I, I didn't use of a mesh because I have the, that, those fears at the beginning and I end up the surgery with a sleeve gastrectomy and the closure of this defect. You know what happened? That this is what happened. This is the same patient. Uh, year, uh, a year later, the patient came back with the recurrent. You see the stitches open and you see the hole. So I have to gain back and repair the ventral hernia. And this is the trend in the literature. You can see paper like this one uh, from USA in which there was 22% uh, of recurrence after uh, the defect, the defect closure and 0% after the youth of a mesh. Same, similar results. This other paper, 25% recurrence with defect closure, 0% with a mesh. And this other paper, 100% of recurrence after defect closure, even what just was just one case and 9% after uh, the use of a mesh. So the answer is clear. Laparoscopy, use a mesh, and then we come to the uh, third question. Uh, should we use, what mesh we should use? There was, some tr there was some trend in the beginning that since we are going to have, a, the, uh, uh, there was a con potential contamination in the abdominal cavity, why don't, uh, why shouldn't you, we use a biological mesh instead of a permanent mesh? But you see that all the paper published in the literature coming from biological mesh and special about using laparoscopy uh, uh, for uh, with a um, uh, with a biological mesh like the Lapsis trial published this year. You see that the rate of of recurrence is higher and the use of permanent mesh have been tested uh, in, during ventral hernia repair, even we, when you have an uh, um, uh, opening of the bowel. It is recommended to close the opening and place the mesh. So why not performing a bariatric pr procedure and place the mesh? So the, uh, the answer goes in that direction. And even this systematic review in which they compare simple suture, synthetic mesh and biological mesh, you see, that with uh, no difference in mesh infection rate and no difference in reoperation, the rate of recurrence is lower with the use of synthetic mesh compared with suture, as we saw before, and with biological mesh. So the answer is clear after the literature repair, review and this systematic review, use a permanent mesh. So we have here the answer of how to do it. Laparoscopy, in, uh, in an iPhone mesh and uh, use a permanent mesh. 
And what about the bariatric procedure? Should we change the bariatric procedure when performing the repair of a ventral hernia? So the first thing we have to analyze if there is a difference in comorbidity when you perform both procedures at the same time and you perform a sleeve or a gastric bypass. So uh, we go back to this paper in which uh, it was shown that there was a, a higher morbidity when you perform both uh, procedures at the same time. But you see that there is no difference in terms of if you perform a sleeve gastrectomy of a gastric bypass. So that this doesn't change the game. So you can proceed, proceed and perform the same procedure that you have in mind uh, from the beginning when you are going to perform a ventral hernia repair. What about if you perform a, a, a sleeve gastrectomy? Just go ahead, place your torque a little bit higher. And if you are performing a gastric bypass, the only thing is that you have to leave the omentum incarcerated, open a gap in the omentum and take the bowel and go over uh, the colon and, and take it to do the uh, uh, gastrojejunal anastomosis. If you're having an incisional hernia, if you have umbilical, infraumbilical or bilateral, don't change the procedure. The only thing, if you have a supraumbilical hernia, uh, you have to evaluate intraoperative if you should change your technique. And you have to advise the patient that you are going to do the procedure that you have in mind, but you might change uh, your strategy depending on the adhesions that you find intra-abdominally. So at the end, uh, you have the answer from all this, uh, all my experience and all the review, but it still is a, a controversial issue with no consensus. We need, uh, we need a consensus. We need evidence. This is clear because there is no enough evidence. And in the meantime, my advice is do a tailored approach based on the algorithm that I propose. So uh, laparoscopy surgery, similar results. Uh, when you repair a ventral hernia that in patient with lower BMI, the idea is to defer the surgery, even that concomitant is safe. And if you have a patient asymptomatic with the menton incarcerated, uh, just leave the menton in place. And there is no problem when you do concomitant surgery to use a permanent mesh. So thank you very much for the invitation and I'm open for the Q&A to answer all your, uh, the question that you might have. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for extensive and overall review concerning uh, concomitant surgery of bariatric procedure and abdomen over hernia. But it is very difficult to make a decision because uh, the, the patient is very unique, characteristic, has unique characteristics individuality of ventral hernia. I think almost every ventral hernia has its own advantage or disadvantages. So I don't know, still I don't know what is the, the, the best way to treat the, the, post, the patient has post disease. Uh, by the way, I saw uh, the interesting paper of the, the same, just like uh, you, and the, the paper saying that the surgical technique is rather important than the patient's status to conduct a simultaneous operation. So, so to speak, regardless of patient's status, it may be possible to conduct simultaneously if we can complete the procedure without using any artificial machine. Just, uh, so what do you think about this? Well, what I think is, of course, that you have to individualize your decision. Mm -hmm. Individualize your decision means that you don't have a ventral hernia and, a, and, and an obese patient. You have a patient with two problems, obesity and a ventral hernia. And you, ha you have to adapt. You have to have previous and a strategy. And what I explained in my presentation was the strategy that you have to have in mind. Uh, to face the patient. Uh, so you, with this strategy, then you start facing the patient and start deciding, depending on the patient characteristic, the type of ventral hernia, and of course, every single patient is totally different. In my opinion, what I think is this: with this strategy, I will say that in 90% of the patients that have ventral hernia and a bariatric procedure to be done, 
we don't operate concomitant the, the ventral hernia. This is uh, the goal that we have in mind because mm -hmm. I prefer to defer the surgery and to operate with a plastic surgeon and do the, and perform the dermal epectomy and the ventral hernia one year later. Okay, thank you so much for your nice presentation and lecture. Thank you. Thank okay. you, it's a pleasure. Thank yeah. you for the invitation. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is no question and the comment in the, in the audience. So we have to move to the next topic. The third topic is uh, uh, mediastinal migration of the sleep gastrectomy. And um, on the estimated pro problem is a speaker is a professor Kathleen Copes. I I'd like to introduce uh, the, the speaker briefly. He is a head of surgery department, uh, director of bariatric center of uh, excellence and the Pondoras Academic Hospital, Bucharest, Romania. And he is a pioneer and developed material metabolic surgery, including many fields of laparoscopic general surgery in Romania. He has uh, several scientific and uh, social recognition and uh, being his work award in the several international congress and uh, being named one of the best surgeons in Europe. Okay. So, the Dr. Uh, Kathleen, please. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the invitation to the K-Sales Congress. I'm honored by the opportunity to speak at the K-Sales EAS Joint Symposium, discussing about the hot topic in bariatric surgery, mediastinal or intrathoracic migration after sleep gastrectomy, arguing why it is an underestimated problem. Nothing important to disclose related to this topic. Just on the last year, 2020, because of the pandemic, less bariatric surgeries has been performed and mostly they were sleeve gastrectomies. This concept is the dominant star in bariatric surgery, widening the indication range of metabolic surgery. Nobody is surprised to see this uh, ascending line of uh, sleeve uh, overcoming all the other procedures. And why is this? not only because it's an efficient bariatric and metabolic surgery procedure, but it's a better solution for many programs, patients, and particular metabolic situations. And this is filling up the position of the sleeve dominating over the other procedures. And in some programs, we are reaching up to 70% or even 80% of uh, the procedures that will be performed uh, sleeve gastrectomy as primary procedures, as probably it is in Korea too. However, there are some drawbacks and controversies related to any bariatric or surgical procedure. And if some of them, they were overcome by time uh, as the technical improvements occurred, some remained controversies like good bariatric uh, barat esophagus or esophageal uh, cancer. Uh, is it that nightmare to, uh, uh, when we think about GERD after sleeve, as it is in these uh, studies, uh, rising up to uh, more than 50% Barrett after some years of the, after sleeve, uh, and 70% almost GERD after sleeve? Uh, is it... Uh, to be worried about that uh, cancer is going to come in these patients uh, uh, or uh, some other studies are, um, which are demonstrating the positive effect of a sleeve on the GERD are right in this respect. Uh, arguing that reducing intra-abdominal pressure after weight loss or reducing the acid production and accelerating the gastric emptying. Um, moreover, uh, performing a hiatal hernia repair concomitant with the sleeve may improve the good outcomes. Who is right? Is it a negative or a positive impact? However, Good after sleeve gastrectomy might have possible mechanisms as they are listed in here. And while most of them were controlled now with the improvement of the technical aspects of the sleeve 
technique. Uh, some are still on controversies, and these are hiatal hernias and intra-thoracic migration um, of the sleeve. Because in the patients with GERD and sleeve, we are not always seeing a picture like this one in the left side of the slide with a hiatal hernia that is depicted in here. And now we have the answer for the GERD. But in most of the cases, we see only an intrathoracic migration of the gastric tube, which is the presence of the upper part of the sleeve into the chest. And this is not easy to, to be seen by endoscopy, by simple radiological studies, or uh, a, a CT, uh, while we are not seeing uh, uh, in details about this modification. And this intrathoracic migration has been described almost 10 years ago, and it is still underestimated. These are very nice uh, uh, results of a study recently published in IRCAT, uh, demonstrated with dynamic MRI that after the sleeve, the studies were performed before and after the surgery, that after the sleeve, they, uh, there are modifications very important that might explain the causes of gastroesophageal reflux after gastric sleeve in re reducing the intra-abdominal length of the esophagus and increasing the angle, the insertion angle of the esophagus from 35 to 51 uh, grades and enlarging the opening uh, diameter of the esophagus. And this is exactly um, to translate that uh, the less and the GE junction are progressively going up, which is intra-thoracic migration of the sleeve. Which are the possible causes of the sleeve, uh, of the migration of the sleeve into the chest? a pre-existing hiatal hernia that was not repaired during the primary procedure and how this is coming, we should expect that more than 50% of the patients, of the bariatric patients, should have hiatal hernia, while the hiatal hernia repair is only less than 10% in most of the studies. Um, another cause can be an inefficient hiatal hernia repair, not preventing the intrathoracic migration with a um, not adequate dissection length, crura approximation, or breaking down the GE uh, junction surrounding ligaments. Or in time, we might encounter the changing of the anatomy while the patient is losing weight and the intrathoracic and the migration come uh, over as an evolutive and a progressive process. Intrathoracic migration after sleep gastrectomy is an underestimated problem. And because of this is not routinely evaluated, not planned to be addressed. And we should say that this is not only associated with sleeve gastrectomy, but with any other bariatric procedure. And knowing this, it is inefficient to change a sleeve to a gastric bypass without addressing the hiatal hernia or intrathoracic migration, because this is not going to solve the problem. Uh, a recent study from Austria demonstrated that even after ruin white gastric bypass, the intrathoracic migration is present, and two thirds of the patient of the patients are encountering migration of uh, the gastric pouch, and one third uh, got symptomatic. Uh, uh, scenario concluding that the intrathoracic migration is unreported finding after revised, uh, revised uh, gastric bypass and missed as, um, as a gastroscopy. And this is another study arguing that ruin white gastric bypass associated with the best anti-reflux operation 
might have seven years after the ruin my gastric bypass an associated of at least half of the operating patients requiring continuous anti-reflux medication, which means that the treatment efficacy of the gastric bypass on reflux symptoms might be overestimated. And why is this? Because there is an intrathoracic migration. In gastric sleeve, the migration incident, incidence is um, pretty high. I mean, in the symptomatic GERD population can be more than 60%. In the general sleeve population, it's difficult to evaluate as we are not addressing this issue. In our study, I will come over about more than 50% of the patients might encounter the migration of the upper sleeve if we do not prevent this. In Genco's study, 76% at five years, it's at five years have had encountered intrathoracic migration, while the acute migration uh, is pretty rare. Um, it is um, a uh, dramatic scenario. We have to go back immediately for surgery, but this is very rare, less than 0%. So if the numbers are so high, we need for intrathoracic migration prevention and of course, surgical therapy. How we can address to the diagnostic of the intrathoracic migration with the simple fluoroscopy, we can see where the G junction is if we have marked it before as it is in the left side picture of this slide with a medium large clip or after, while there is an intrathoracic migration, we can see clearly that the marker is above the diaphragmatic line. And this is uh, uh, the way we are encountering if there is a migration or not. Uh, if there is not a market there, it's difficult to use the uh, uh, GI studies in fluoroscopy. Endoscopy might show up a shorter distance from cardiac erosions, esophagitis, and the pH metry might encounter a abnormal acid exposure. However, the best solution is the CT scan um, and the MRI studies. In order to prevent the intrathoracic migration after sleeve, we should carefully rule out and proper fix the hiatal hernia, knowing that hiatal hernia might be missed during the preoperative workup, during the surgery, if we are not dissecting properly the GE junction, and if we are leaving a too large hiatus. And this is not enough because we know that standalone hyotoplasty is a particular ineffective. So we need to do something more because the frequent, frequent scenario is after the heart hernia is repaired, is complete, the migration is facilitated because of the uh, lifting up of the G junction while the diaphragm is moving down after the CO2 insufflation, as it is demonstrated is in this drawing. And this is happening immediately after the surgery. So we need to go um, uh, to fixate somehow uh, the gastric tube into the abdominal structures, to the pancreatic fascia, uh, do any cardiopexy or esophagopexy, do a... Um, um, ligamentum terrace ter um, augmentation or fixating to the omentum. This is an example of the fixation to the pre-aortic fascia. This is the, the fixation to the pre-pancreatic fascia, which is keeping down the, the gastric tube into uh, the abdomen by fixating to a, a something that is solid and not moving during the surgery. Uh, this is the uh, recreating of phrenoesophageal membrane. In our, um, in our opinion, the best uh, and the, the most efficient uh, uh, method to keep uh, the inferior um, esophagus uh, into the abdomen and prevent the reflux and the migration that is immediately after the heart or hernia repair. Or we can add a fund application with the sleeve, like an N sleeve, D sleeve, or R sleeve. These are rarely performed, but can be an issue. 
However, using the ligamentum teres, the classical Narbona Arnau procedure to keep uh, the G junction into the abdomen, it is rarely used used in as a primary procedure. But if uh, we are thinking not to prevention, to but to the surgical treatment of the intrathoracic migration, and we would like to maintain this sleeve gastrectomy and not changing to another one like a ruin my gastric bypass, we can use any kind of PEXIS that were uh, previously presented with the ligamentum teres uh, uh, hooking down of the GE junction as it is uh, nicely presented in this, uh, uh, in this slide. Or if we would like to convert Ruan Y gastric bypass as a surgical treatment for intrathoracic migration, after the performance of the Ruan Y gastric bypass, we should also use a esophago uh, pexy or a uh, hooking down with Narbona Arnau to prevent the migration that might occur also after the uh, Ruinoi gastric bypass. In order to conclude, I would like to underline that intrathoracic migration has a uh, high incidence and this uh, a situation is expected to be very high after sleeve gastrectomy, but not only, even after uh, other bariatric and metabolic procedures. The sleeve concept might not be the cause of the GERD, but the intrathoracic migration and hiatal hernia might be. The hiatal hernia repair and in, uh, intrathoracic migration prevention should be always considered and surgery might be necessary to control the GERD after sleeve gastrectomy while addressing always the hiatal hernia and the intrathoracic migration. Thank you so much. Okay, it's a very much instructive lecture. <clears throat> I agree with you that uh, it's very important issue but uh, easily overlooked. And uh, I think uh, the uh, according to your presentation, the fixation of the, the stomach or, or something to the, the intraabdominal cavity is a routinely, routine is a recommendation, your, your recommendation, routinely perform of fixation. Yeah, I think there is a tendency to go up into the chest that should be aware about, mm. and we need to uh, to think about a way to keep the stomach into the abdomen. The original ligaments that we are taking down, the gastrocolic ligament, the gastrolienal ligament, all the structures that we are uh, dividing when we create the long gastric tube, uh, are not available to keep the stomach into the abdomen. And if we are repairing the hiatal hernia, uh, we are cutting the phrenoesophageal membrane. We do a very nice approximation of the crura, but we have no membrane to keep the lower esophageal sphincter under the positive pressure of the abdomen. So we need to think about creating something that nature discovered and, um, and utilized us, which is a, a surgical fixation to something that it's not moving. That's why I didn't mention uh, the omentum because it's moving and the migration is not controlled. Uh, the prepancreatic fascia, the esophagopexy, the anything that might be, including the teres ligamentum, um, in order to uh, be sure that the migration is not uh, a, a free to go process. We noticed by using the clips uh, that I demonstrated uh, in the presentation, there are now more than 4,000 cases we were following over the last six years that immediately after the surgery, the clips are up into the chest. So we said we need to do something. So, um, uh, by this, we did reduce the number of migrations and the consequences in terms of gastroesophageal reflux disease dramatically. 
which is the fear and the nightmare associated with the sleeve, saying in conclusion that not sleeve is responsible for the GERD as a concept, but the moving out, out from the uh, abdominal cavity up into the chest of the sleeve. So no, not sleeve is the problem. Some other things that we are now understanding and performing mm -hmm. associated with. And I'm honored to be with you in this year, wonderful EIS case cells uh, <laughs> joint symposium. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, but uh, I don't know, the, every procedure is uh, has uh, their own side effect uh, a little bit. So, is there any side the complication or something wrong with the your, your fixation in, or immobilization? Is there no, no, nothing? we didn't encounter. I mentioned thousands of patients we are mm -hmm. following. No, no okay. associated complication, but improvements, yes. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, instructive lecture. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, there is no for the question or comment. So let's move to the, the final uh, topic. Okay. The final topic is, uh, I thought final topic is uh, the perspective of metabolic surgery based on the result of long limb bypass reconstruction after surgery. The presented by the Sung Ho Che, Professor Sung Ho Che. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Sung Ho Che as briefly. Uh, he is uh, uh, one of the leading surgeons, a uh, pioneer of uh, Korean Metabolic and Diabetic Surgery Society. And he is also a famous gastric cancer surgeon also. I think more presentation about the Professor Sung Ho Che would not be necessary in the Korean audience. So let's go get to the, the main subject, please. How are you, everyone? It is very nice for me to have a chance to present my topic in this uh, symposium. This is Sung Ho Choi from Yonsei University, Korea. I have nothing to disclose in this presentation. Let me start this presentation with this slide. In 2009, Buchwald demonstrated very surprising data. Many patients undergoing bariatric surgery have been completely resolved in this diabetes. He showed us that 83.7% of diabetes were resolved after gastric bypass. In contrast, 19.9%, almost 100% were resolved after BPD or DS. So, let us think that what is the difference between gastric bypass or BPD? The size of a pouch is bigger in BPD. This suggests that size of a pouch does not contribute to the effect of a BPD. However, the length of a root limb and the length of a biliopancreatic limb are very long and the length of a common limb are very short in BPD, comparing to gastric bypass. So, we can assume that different lengths of a root limb, biliopancreatic limb, or common limb of a BPD contribute the great effect on diabetes. But problem of a BPD is severe malabsorption and or nutritional deficiency. This fact led us to find a good window, in other words, optimal length of each limb, which is very effective on diabetes and minimal malabsorption or nutritional deficiency. Let me think another point. Obese patient with type 2 diabetes can be managed by metabolic surgery. 
It is gold standard, especially in case of young age. However, we may meet a patient who have gastric cancer and type 2 diabetes. Generally, these patients are non-obese and old age. The post-operative cause of diabetes after gastrectomy were very interesting in gastric cancer patients with diabetes. Maybe we can understand the natural cause of our long-term result of diabetes after metabolic surgery through this case, especially in Asia, including Korea. And we can find a better way of reconstruction after gastrectomy for gastric cancer and metabolic surgery. Between the 1950s and the 1970s, it was reported that diabetes improved or resolved after gastrectomy in patients with gastric cancer and diabetes in the West. Also, Lanzarini from Chile reported a similar result. He demonstrated that diabetes was completely resolved in 65% after gastrectomy in patients with gas cancer or peptic ulcer at a BMI of 35 or below. So, we analyzed similar cases. Mean follow-up period was almost three years, and the number of patients who was involved in this study was 403. However, percent of resolution was 14.4%, and in subtotal cases, it was 10.8%. And Dr. Lee analyzed the Korean nationwide data, and this study demonstrated that only 10% of patients with diabetes discontinued anti-diabetic drugs after gastrectomy due to gas cancer. We reviewed the retrospective observational study, and they showed a similar result overall emission rate is not high. An Ji Young prospectively observed the post-operative diabetic cause after gastrectomy in gastric cancer with type 2 diabetes. Weight was decreased slightly after gastrectomy. Interesting part is the HOMA IR which is a mark of insulin resistance. In preoperative period, all patients showed increased HOMA IR. And after one year, HOMA IR of all group returned into normal or nearly normal range. However, after subtotal gastrectomy, hemoglobin A1C level was not significantly changed. And after total gastrectomy, hemoglobin A1C was decreased. As you can see, in total gastrectomy group, preoperative HOMA IR was slightly lower than that of other groups, and HOMA IR was completely normalized after one year. As you know, the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes is not fully clarified, but diabetes consists of two factors, which are insulin resistance and the pancreatic beta cell function. And in obesity-related diabetes, insulin resistance is main factor and this insulin resistance 
induce finally failure of pancreatic beta cell compensation, result is type 2 diabetes. And returning into normal from increased insulin resistance result in returned pancreatic beta cell function. However, in case of insulin secretion dysfunction predominant type 2 diabetes, which non-obese frequent in Asian and African, there is possibility that after metabolic surgery, recovery of diabetes is limited. Again, let me compare the Chile data and the Korean data in Nanjarini data. Preoperative BMI was almost 30, and in Korean data, BMI was around 25. So in both cases, insulin resistance is increased, but in Korean case, which is non-obese, there is a high possibility that pancreas beta cell function is deteriorated in preoperative period. So, we concluded that the recovery of type 2 diabetes is limited in gastric cancer with type 2 diabetes, who is non-obese and old age after conventional reconstruction with the gastrectomy. So next question is that does modification of reconstruction method improve the diabetes cause after gastrectomy? Again, let us remember BPD which is very long biliopancreatic and rurium and they showed high instance of severe malabsorption. And in Asian people who have carbohydrate-rich food, it is very risky for protein deficiency. However, remission rate is very excellent. So, after gastrectomy, conventional reconstruction is insufficient with respect to diabetes. The biliopancreatic divergence style is considered excessive, and the proper surgery is halfway between these two procedures. So we tested the effect of a long limb on diabetic cause. It was prospective phylo study. After gastrectomy, it was reconstructed by Ruangwai gastrogegenostomy or esophagogegenostomy. The biliopancreatic and the rurim were 100 to 120 cm long each. We tested 15 cases, and in 11 patients, at the one year after surgery, hemoglobin A1c decreased to less than 6% without any anti-diabetic medication. We calculated insulin resistance and the pancreatic beta cell function in this good responder. Good responder was defined that hemoglobin A1c decreased to less than 6% without any anti-diabetic medications after one year. Good responder was 11 patients. Homa beta is a mark of a pancreatic beta cell function and this Homa beta is improved after surgery in good responder group. Masuda index and the HOMA IR are index of insulin resistance 
and all patients showed improved insulin resistance after surgery. And the insulinogenic index is a marker of a pancreatic beta cell function. And in remission group, insulinogenic index was improved after surgery, but non-remission group, insulinogenic index was not improved. Recently, we analyzed multi-center results of long limb bypass after gastrectomy in patients with gastric cancer and type 2 diabetes. This study is retrospective, observational, and the control group was conventional below 2. And in this study, preoperative clinical data showed no significant differences in sex, age, diabetes duration, diabetes control, BMI, hemoglobin A1C level, or fasting blood sugar level between the two groups. And three, six, nine months and one year after surgery, the mean FBS and the hemoglobin A1C levels in the long limb group decreased more significantly than those in the conventional below two groups. However, nutritional profiles such as hemoglobin A1C level, BMI reduction, and albumin level were not significantly different between the two groups. Regarding diabetic remissions, there was only one partial remission and no complete remission in the conventional pillows 2 group. However, in the long limb group, four patients, 3.1%, had a partial remission and 11 patients, 8.5% had a complete remission. Diabetes control improvement was significantly different between two groups as measured by glycemic control outcomes as one year after surgery. As you can see, the rate of remission is not high even though in case of long limb reconstruction. However, in old diabetic patients, drug-induced hypoglycemic event, which is very critical and lethal, so many old diabetic patients are uncontrolled. So well-controlled diabetes is another target for old age diabetes. Of course, this study design is not perfect and it is retrospective, but the result of this study suggests that increased length of LURIM limb and or biliopancreatic limb might improve the postoperative diabetic cause in all and non obese patients. And another suggestion is that the effect of long limb on diabetes is not strongly perfect. This is the conclusion. Korean old non-obese patient with type 2 diabetes showed limited improvement of diabetes after gastrectomy. This implied that metabolic surgery should be cautious for patients with old non-obese patient with type 2 diabetes. And for reconstruction after gastrectomy, Long limb can be considered even though we need prospective study. Okay, thank you very much for nice, uh, very much for interesting research and the nice presentation. Uh, there is no question on the further uh, comment on, so I have a, a question. Uh, just with your data. Uh, your conclusion is reasonable, I think so. But uh, I feel like there is something uh, hidden mechanism 
of diabetic improvement, which should be established or eliminated. So if you agree with this, my idea, do you have any further uh, study or the plan of the, the research of this, uh, the, the, this problem? Do you have any, any schedule or plan to uh, discover the, the issue? Thank you for your uh, nice uh, uh, question. Uh, still, uh, the, the effect, the mechanism of the effect of uh, diabetes surgery is a mystery. And uh, uh, as I uh, mentioned that, that uh, uh, we want to improve of a pancreatic beta cell function at the surgery. But problem is that uh, we cannot uh, we cannot know before surgery, mm -hmm. which one case improvement, which one is not. Uh, even though there is some score system, but it is not uh, clear, uh, it's not perfect. And uh, study, maybe uh, some surgeon uh, have a plan to uh, have a prospective study for this idea. And I expect uh, several years after, uh, maybe we can understand the metabolic surgery further. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your nice presentation. And uh, okay, uh, it's time to finish our uh, session. And uh, I'd like to thank all the attendees of this uh, symposium. And uh, thank you very much for everybody the, who joined us together with uh, this symposium. Thank you so much.